This fist city one problem solving looks at a tank system problem. Now, as a way of background, you'll notice that the previous videos on problem solving have given us a possible technique for problem solving, and it's summarised as an iteration through a number of steps. First, write down what is the topic and what you know about the topic. Second, ask what information you've been given. And three, ask if you can create new information given what you've got from one and two. Now that's a simplistic summary. Key point is, what we're going to do here is introduce the concept of problem inversion, which is how you often get realistic problems in engineering. Now these are distinct from exercises where what you do is you apply standard rules and you get to an answer. With problem inversion, you start from the answer and you try to work out the question. And that might seem slightly bizarre, but it's more linked to design. You know what you want the solution to be, and so the question is, how should you design the process in the first place? So some background. Before we do problem solving, this is what we would expect you to do. First, list what you know, and therefore it's implicit that you've got a comprehensive awareness and competence with all the core knowledge that is relevant. If you're not competent in core knowledge, you won't be able to solve a problem. And second, make sure you've got to hand all the tools that you think you might need. So these might be things like data sheets of key mathematical and engineering formula or laws and so on. And so we'll assume that you've always got those to hand. Let's move on to the problem then. And you'll see what we mean when we say that this problem is more about design than actually going through step, set steps to get to a solution. So here's the problem. You want to design a tank for the flush system of a toilet, and you'll all have seen those many, many times. And here's the question. How big should the tank be? And how big should the tank outlet be? And that's it. It's a design problem. And you'll notice you cannot answer this simply by applying memorized routines from your notes. It won't get you anywhere. So we need a technique to solve this. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to ask, what is the topic? What information have I been given? And can I use these two pieces of information together to create new information and ultimately to move towards some idea as to how to answer the question I'm given at the start? But what you'll notice is if I start by doing things like what is the topic and then look at the information I've been given, often the solution will drop out without me doing anything in particular. First then, what do I know? Well, I know this thing, this question is about tanks, and I can draw a tank a bit like the one given here. Now, what else do I know about tanks? Well, I know that I could, for example, have a pressure, and I'll write it in red, P2 up here, and at the outlet, I could assume it was the same pressure. I can assume I've got a flow rate coming out of this tank, and what's driving that flow rate is there's a different pressure at the bottom of the tank, due to the depth of the liquid. So I can now write down a model for a simple tank system, which you'll see is covered in the videos on modeling. So what have I got? Data like the volume of the tank is the cross-sectional area times the depth. The volume of liquid stored is dependent on the depth of the liquid. The rate of change of volume in the tank is minus the flow out, because clearly the volume is going down if flow is going out. The flow out depends on the difference in pressure between the bottom of the tank down here and the outlet here. And that difference in pressure is given by the standard formula rho gh. So I'm doing this very quickly because it's standard tank modelling. But remember, what we're saying is always start with what do I know? And these are things that you know. So write them down because they might be relevant. If I put all that together, I end up with this standard tank model here model with no inflow, that A th dt plus rho gh over r equals zero. And that governs the depth in the tank. Now what else do I know? Well, once I've got this model, there it is, it's a first order model, I know that I must have first order dynamics. And what this graph is doing over here is it's showing you the expected change in depth with time for a simple first order model of this type. And you'll notice the scales are written in terms of time constant, okay? So that the system basically empties 
it empties 63% of the way after t seconds, 84% after 2 t seconds, and so on. Now, one thing that might be really important to us if we're talking about toilets is the initial flow rate. That's how harsh is the flush at the very outset, because it's the first part of the flush which really makes a big difference. Now, the first part of the flush is given by this initial gradient. Okay? And we can work out that initial gradient. That's again a standard result. So the rate of change of volume with time is given by this formula here, minus rho g over r times h of 0. And that's quite useful. So we now know the initial flush rate. And you'll notice all we've done is ask questions, what do I know about tank systems? So that's just repeating the same issue. You'll see a reasonable flow rate or gradient is maintained for about one time constant. Now that's very approximate because clearly after one time constant, your flow rate's down to 37% of what it was at the start. And the time constant, you will all know this, is given by this term here, Ra over rho g. So next, let's ask ourselves, what do I know? Right, what else do I know? Well, what we might want to work out is what the flow rate is from this tank and through the pipe. Now, what you can do is you can go to some books and you can look up some formula, and you'll find there's one formula which tells you the flow through a circular tube of lint L, radius R, is given by something like this. Now, I should emphasize here that what you'll realize is that for most toilets, the way the water gets from the tank to the system is not through a straight pipe, a bit like this. The pipe is going to be somewhat, or the route's going to be somewhat more tortuous. So therefore, this formula is generous, okay? I.e. it gives large flows. So this formula here is going to give much larger flows than you will get in practice. But nevertheless, it's a good start point because it's a formula we can find relatively easily. Now, the viscosity of water is given here, 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds. OK. If you ask yourself, well, for a typical toilet, the outlet pipe is a length around 50 centimetres. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a bit here and say, looking at toilets, you would say, well, the radius of the pipe is usually about 1 centimetre. We can change this later, because this is one of the design questions. If I put these two numbers into this formula, OK, you'll see it's got length L and it's got radius R. Then you will end up with R having a value about 10 to the 5. Now, so far we've largely ignored the problem and focused on clarifying key background information linked to tanks and flow through pipes and things of that nature. So what have we discovered? We've said the initial flush rate is minus rho g over R times the initial depth. And we've worked out that a value of r somewhere of the order of 10 to the 5 is probably going to be roughly what we want. Rho g is 10 to the 4. The initial flush rate is minus 0.1 times the initial depth. And this may be an overestimate as it used pipe resistance without an entrance, exit, corners, and so on. So essentially, where this 0.1 has come from is from here. OK, this rho g over r. And you'll see this R has come from a simplistic assumption. So in other words, this initial flush rate could be an overestimate. The actual flush rate is probably a little bit less. And the length of the flush we discovered was Ra over rho g, which is 10a. Again, putting in these numbers R and rho g that we've derived here. Now, let's have a look what requirements are going to be given. The actual question was, how big should the tank be? and how big should the tank outlet be? All right. And we note here, we did cheat a bit, because on the previous slide, we put in a radius of one centimeter for the outlet pipe. Now, you can change that, OK? But just be aware, at the moment, we've put that assumption in, and that will affect where we go. Now, implicit in the effectiveness of a toilet are the following two issues. What flow rate is required for an effective flush? And how long should this flow rate be sustained? for the flush to be effective. Now, what you could do is you could go home 
and you could get yourself a bucket, a nice big bucket, and you could practice very crudely with different flow rates, uh, different lengths of flow rate and so on, and get an impression of what sort of flow rates are needed, what sort of lengths of flow rates are needed, and basically by trial and error you can get to a point that says this sort of flush consistently will deliver what I want. Now what I'm going to suggest, and again this is an approximate, you could do this yourself, that an initial flush rate something of the order of 5 litres per second and a length of flush of the order of 5 seconds is not going to be a long way away from what you want. You can disagree if you like, it doesn't really matter because we're illustrating a process here. So the initial flow rate is going to be 0 0.005 metres cubed per second. Now what I can do is pair up the knowledge I know about tank systems and the requirements I've got for the toilet to be effective. So the initial flush rate was 0 0.180 uh, metres cubed per second and the length of flush was 10A. But we also know that we want the initial flush rate to be 5 litres per second and the length of flush to be 5 seconds. So if I put these two formula together, what you find is this. 0 0.180 must be 0 0.005. Well, in other words, H0 is 0 0.005. Now that's in metres, which gives you 5 centimetres. And you might be saying, golly, that's a bit smaller than I expected. Normal cisterns are a lot deeper than 5 centimetres. And of course, that's going to make you ask questions. Have I made an incorrect assumption earlier? Because the answer I've got here isn't what I expected. And the likelihood is you'll come up with a conclusion. Perhaps R was too small, um, <coughs> which is one of the things that we indicated. OK. If we look at the length of the flush, we get 10A approximately 5, which gives you A approximately 0.5. And again, you might say, this seems rather large. Um, maybe the flush doesn't need to last for 5 seconds. Well, in fact, if you change R, you may find that the answer you get here changes as well. Now, just to have interest, the implied volume of the system is AH0, which is about 25 litres. And you might be saying, well, actually, that doesn't sound too far away from what I would expect. So let's do some reflections. Simple numbers, physics and algebra suggest a tank of depth 5 metres and cross-sectional area 0.5 metres squared. That's what we've got from our simple analysis. But in practice, because we know about systems, we know they tend to be much deeper than 5 centimetres and they certainly haven't got a cross-sectional area of 0.5 metre cubed. So what's likely to be the problem? We did recognise what we used for R was a very crude estimate, very, very crude indeed. Now, if we were to underestimate this by, for example, a factor of 4, that would give us an underestimate of the depth by a factor of 4 and a similar overestimate of the area. An overestimate of the flush rate or flush time would also result in an overestimate of the volume of the tank. And if you're not sure about that, I guess the thing to do is go and do some more tests and make sure that we've got better values for the required flush rate and volume. Now, we've tacitly ignored questions on designing the outflow pipe. Okay, We know the outflow pipe is not going to be just a straight line about this, like this. Um, and how would you investigate the impact of changes to this type of fat pipe, which in fact gives you changes to R? Now, all this is beyond, really, first year syllabus. The purpose of this video is to get you to think, to get you to say, how might I approach problems which are not a simple reproduction of the notes? So what have we done? We've given an example of problem solving, and we've demonstrated a simple approach which involves a few key steps. First, ask what topics might be involved, and ask what you know about that topic. And you see, that's what we did first. Then, look at the requirements you've been given, and say, how does the knowledge I've got from step one link to these requirements and can I use these two in combination and finally ask what you've been asked to do and remember this is key all the time sometimes it's critical it's, it's okay to be critical of assumptions I've made some assumptions in this video and you might say well I think that was a bit weak you could do better there well if you're saying that then you're beginning to understand how to be an engineer and how to solve problems and finally, we've reminded the students many times in these videos that real problems might not have clean analytic or even unique solutions. And ultimately, you have to justify what you do.